Okay, so um, we're back after two weeks. Very happy to have uh, Professor Ricardo Hausman with us. Um, last time, as you remember, um, we talked with Professor Altemolo on uh, his theory of institutions, and also um, uh, we discussed issues of uh, new technologies and uh, its impact on labor markets. So today, the, the, the topic is um, front and center uh, new theories of economic growth, and uh, uh, Ricardo has been doing extremely uh, important and interesting stuff here, and so we want to use uh, his vision of what drives economic growth uh, and productivity um, as, um, a, um, as, as another window opening to our uh, discussion of uh, um, uh, the new institutions to sustain uh, inclusive uh, economic growth. So as usual, we're going to give our speaker five to ten minutes, and then we'll have a discussion. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so um, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have said in the past that uh, institutions and productivity, sorry, institutions and technology, are two words that should have been invented by diplomats. Because diplomats are in the business of hiding disagreement over what they mean so that they can all sign and they communicate and, and, and think they know what they're talking about. Uh, and, and so institutions and technology are, in my mind, the least well-defined things that there are in economics. Everybody agrees that they're critical because nobody knows what they're talking about. So, I'm not going to talk now about institutions. I'm going to talk about mainly about technology. But I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a more precise definition of technology. And I'm going to try to extract from that definition of technology some implications for how it grows and what are its social uh, consequences. Okay? I'm going to say that technology is like the Catholic God. I'm Jewish, so I don't, I'm trespassing. But uh, the Catholic God is one, and it's three at the same time, right? It's a holy trinity. I don't know exactly what it means, but in the case of technology, I'm going to argue it's one thing. It's knowledge. But it's knowledge that appears in three different instantiations, three different ontologies, okay? It's what we might call embodied knowledge in tools, code, tools, uh, materials, and so on. It's codified knowledge in codes, recipes, in protocols, how to do manuals, <coughs> and passive knowledge in brains. So it's three very different ontologies. Tools are things you can move around. They exist in three-dimensional space. If you want technology, I can ship it to you. Codes exist in a symbolic space. They can be you know, ink over paper. They can be you know, images on a screen. They can be ones and zeros, right? And they move in a different place. It's not the ink. It's not the paper. It's a symbol where the, the thing re resides, okay? So it's a different ontology. <coughs> and know-how is a processing ability of the brain that is in your brain but not in you. Uh, you know, you are just one of the many things your brain does for you, okay? Uh, so you can, you say, you tend to say that you know how to walk. But more precisely, we should say that your brain knows how to walk. Because if I start asking you, tell me, what muscles do you move when you walk? In what order do you fire them? What adjustments do you do to keep your balance? You have no clue. It's in your brain, but not in you as a self, as a self-aware entity, okay? So know-how is like walking, if you want. It's what you do to achieve things in the world. It's a processing machine. It's not information. It's the CPU that can process information and know how to respond and react. So know-how <coughs> resides only in brains and moves with enormous difficulty from brain to brain. In the same way as, you know, <coughs> if you talk to a, 
you know, a, a, a famous violinist or tennis player, your violin playing and your tennis game don't improve. It's not something that gets transmitted as information gets transmitted. It's the rewiring of the brain. So that's what technology is, is these three things. And as you can imagine, it's very easy to move tools. It's very easy to send emails. It's very hard to move know-how from brain to brain. So what's going to slow down the diffusion of technology is going to be know-how. Now, it, the know-how that you need to make something is a variable that is extremely interesting. Because you can ask yourself, how much know-how does it get to do something? Or inversely, you know, Harvard was founded in 1636. Uh, that was before Newton, before Lavoisier, before Linnaeus, and uh, Darwin, before Locke and Hume and, <coughs> and whatever, uh, Einstein and so on. So since 1636, supposedly we have much more knowledge to teach. In 1636, a college degree lasted four years. So if it's now we have a thousand times more stuff to teach, it should last 4,000 years, <laughs> right? No, it still lasts four years. So how has the system adjusted to this massive increase in knowledge? How has it adjusted? Well, it doesn't put all the knowledge in all the brains. It puts different bits of knowledge in different brains. So the way the system a society accumulates more know-how is not by individuals knowing more, but by individuals knowing different. So modern production requires you, you, you to know about procurement, about human resource management, about production, <coughs> about finance, about accounting, about taxes, about contracts, eh, about marketing, about eh, you know whatever, right? I can go on. It's not that Everybody knows everything, except you have an accountant, you have a marketing guy, etc. You have different bits of know-how in different brains because there's a, some limit to the capacity of the brain to hold know-how. Uh, for example, your dentist tends not to be your lawyer. Why? <coughs> Why is your dentist not your lawyer? Well, because if it takes 14 years to become a good dentist, uh, then you're not going to scrap that and start from the beginning to become a good lawyer. So uh, know-how has a limitation on how much it can be accumulated at the individual level. In principle, it has no limitation of how much it can be accumulated at the social level if you can put different bits of know-how in different brains. But then on the opposite side of that is the question how much know-how you need to make something. Well. If you look at uh, you know, India, uh, the average Indian works in an organization of four people. The average American works in an organization of 100 people. You might ask yourself, why do they do that? If there are more Indians than Americans, they should stuff more Indians per firm than Americans. But the reason why they work at very different scales is because in America, you're on average putting together more know-how into making something, then it gets done in India, on average. So you can think of the amount of know-how that goes into a product as the number of people with different skill sets that have to cooperate in order to make that thing. Okay, so, so a, a product is more know-how intensive, the broader the human network that has to be put together to make that thing happen. Okay. And I would put it to you that uh, what technology has involved is, as a consequence, the absorption of technology has involved more division of know-how and more broader connections between humans. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, Karl Marx, 
uh, made a fundamental mistake. Not the one he's typically referred to, but a different one. And I think that mistake is the one that also is motivating uh, Professor Unger here. When, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, he's, he's puzzling over, over, over the mistake in, in, in some sense. It, Marx's vision was the following. He was looking at all of these individual artisans, each one working on his own, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. And they were being displaced by a different form of organization where you would have somebody own the means of production and they becoming proletarians, becoming workers who would just sell their labor to the people owning the means of production. And Marx thought that through that process, everybody would become a proletarian and wages would go down to subsistence level, but that all production would be organized through capitalist means. And capitalism was this sort of like separation of the ownership of the means of production from those providing labor. So, the, you know, what many people have criticized Marx for was his assumption that that would lead to declining wages. Because it actually led to increasing wages during his lifetime. But he made the prediction that capitalism was going to reorganize the whole of society, except for what he thought was uh, the reserve army of the unemployed that were there for a strategic purpose, sort of like to discipline everybody else. But if you look at the developing world, so in the US, you know, 90% of employment is wage labor. In India, probably, I don't know, 15% of employment is wage labor. 85% of employment or so is people self-employed. So in some sense, capitalism did not reorganize production. And as a consequence, production happens in very small units that are adding very little know-how. <coughs> in Latin America, capitalism hires 50% of people. The others are essentially self-employed. They own their means of production, there's no wage labor relationship, etc. And as a consequence, there's very narrow say, aggregation of know-how and the, the things that they do are very low productivity and so on. So, this is why I say that it has to do with Professor Unger's vision. He's saying, okay, now we have this potentially new form of organizing production. Why can't we put everybody there? That's, why isn't the success, in a, a, why can't we achieve the success that Marx predicted with capitalism as sort of like reorganizing the whole of production? Why can't uh, the knowledge economy also reorganize the whole of production and everybody be a participant included into this thing? And I think that that's, that's a great question. I've thought a little bit about that question more in the context of developing countries. And the simplest way to think about it, I think, is to think that production is really a, the construction of human links. The way the metaphor I use is the game of Scrabble. That production is like making words out of letters. So think of letters as being atoms of know-how, individuals, right, that have different skill sets, whatever, right? They're different letters. In order to make a word, you have to bring those letters together. Okay? And a, there is some cost at connecting your letters to other letters. For example, if you're a worker, or a potential worker, you have to get out of your house and go to a place where these letters are being assembled. And, you know, commute times in, in Latin America are, you know, four hours a day, you know, two hours going, two hours coming back. It's, it's a hugely, I mean, the fact that, if you look at, at congestion in India or in, in Vietnam, you say, why the hell would people subject themselves to that you know, pain of going through these crowded city, uh, streets that don't move at all and so on. Why do they incur that pain? Well, because the attractive power of mixing your letter with other letters is, is very large. But the pain is also very large, so many people just prefer uh, 
sort of to stay home, produce from home, not mix their letters with other letters, but that means that they cannot implement technologies that require more know-how. So they're trapped in very low productivity activities because they cannot exploit the division of know-how, if you want. So uh, mixing letters is costly. It has some kind of a fixed cost, <coughs> say. Uh, and um, it leads to bad equilibria in the sense that, uh, I mean, there are many, many networks out there that you need to connect to. You need to connect to the labor market, which implies connecting to the urban transport market, which implies also connecting, you know, uh, having connected to the education market or to, or to the banking system or to the electricity or to the water. So there are many networks that you have to connect to. And the problem of every one of those connections is that to connect you, you have to pay a fixed cost, say, if to connect you to the electricity grid, you have to pay the fixed cost of putting a wire. After I put the wire, selling you kilowatt hours is cheap. But if you're not connected, then you have to go to the hills, cut some wood, and then use wood as your source of energy, right? So, and that's much more expensive in terms of labor, your time, and so on, than it would be to connect you. And so, so, so there's some of these fixed costs. And whenever you have fixed costs, it creates these convexities in economic that leads to potential inefficiencies. In the sense that if you're poor, I don't want to connect you because you're too uninteresting a, co a, a consumer for me to recover my fixed cost. But if I don't connect you, you'll be disconnected. You'll have to work on very low productivity activities and consequently you'll be poor. So if you're poor, I don't connect you, and if I don't connect you, you'll be poor. And so the question is, is there an inefficiency here that has to be tackled? And, and there might be, and so I think that there are two solutions to this fixed cost problem. One solution is technological, and one solution is social policy. The technological solution is to lower these fixed costs. Right, in India, I think, Landlines get to some, something like 6% of households, but cell phones get to 100% of households. Why is it that landlines have not diffused uh, and cell phones have? It's not because landlines are a new technology that hasn't had time to diffuse. Right? Or in Kenya today, uh, there is 80% cell phone penetration, 20% electricity penetration. Why is that? Well, it's not because electricity is a new technology that hasn't had time to diffuse. So, so the difference in these diffusion rates have to do a little bit with the fixed cost. If you find technologies that have lower fixed costs, they diffuse more, they connect more people. That's a technological solution. The second solution is sharing the fixed cost. That's more of a policy solution. Now, if you... A, in 1776, we know what happened in the US. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Postal Service. And think of the Postal Service as the internet of the times. And the Postal Service was created at the beginning with the idea that every incorporated city would have a post office. So that everybody, in some sense, would be connected to the internet. Had you opted for a more sort of like capitalist approach, it would have meant uh, that you know you would have FedEx between New York and Boston and and so on. But screw Springfield because you know who cares, right? There's not enough business there. But they they decided to create the network in a more inclusive way. And I think we face those choices all the time. If you go to a poor village in Switzerland, there is a bus that connects that village to the rest of the place, and that bus is run by the postal system. So the idea of connecting people and somehow sharing the fixed cost of connecting people might be uh, you know, something that allows for the extension of, of, um, of these things. But we should not forget the fact that there are very, 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 very strong, if you think of Production as making words, these words are getting longer, 
uh, new know-how, it means new types of words and so on. That creates enormous economies of agglomeration. There are enormous benefits from being in a bigger place that has more diversity, because the bigger the diversity, the more, the longer the words you can put together. The bigger the, the city, the easier it is for you to find matches of your skills to other skills, and so on. And that creates, you know, enormous pressures for economic concentration, geographic concentration. So there is, you know, is that a sign? That I should stop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, let me finish with, with this idea. Uh, you know, one way to describe the US is that it's a megalopolis between Washington and Boston. It's another megalopolis around Chicago. It's a megalopolis between uh, uh, San Diego and San Francisco. And the rest is a national park. <laughs> and in some sense, that is the political divide of the times. If you see the map, political map of the US, it is these places that have very low population densities, very little kind of diversity of letters. They've been hurt a lot. They are extremely vulnerable because there are very few words that they can put together in those settings. They're very vulnerable to shocks. There, are, there isn't that much diversity in the place just to reconnect. And then, you know, the bicoastal uh, country, you know, uh, are places that, you know, didn't vote for Trump. So it may capture, I think, that there's something deeply technological about uh, the nature of these things that, and, and the nature of the economies of agglomeration that the knowledge economy leads to. Let me stop there. Great. Go ahead, go ahead. more because I would like you to take a few more minutes to spell out the implications of this discourse for the received debates of growth theory and development theory. The implications are implicit, but you haven't fully spelled them out. Um, if I can intercede, maybe you can be clear about what you mean about which received aspects so that Ricardo can respond well, to those. Okay. Classic message of late 20th century development economics that is summarized in the reading from you that is assigned for today. Uh, there are fundamentals, education and institutions, and there's a shortcut. The shortcut is conventional industrialization. And uh, you can go pretty far with a shortcut before you hit against the constraints imposed by the fundamentals. Then we have been concerned in the early weeks of this course with this dilemma that we've called the dilemma of development, that conventional industrialization, this shortcut recommended by development economics, for various reasons, has stopped working and cannot be brought back to life. But the alternative, which would be an inclusive form of the knowledge economy, seems to be inaccessible. So when I asked Ricardo to spell out the implications of his discourse for development theory, I mean the implications for both these sets of ideas, for the traditional message of development economics, and for this new debate that we're attempting to address. Okay, I just wanted to clarify also, I'd like to hear my views described as conventional wisdom. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I, so see I, you, I see you as having <laughs> transcended this, this point so, of view. You know, I just, uh, you know, sort of just wanted to hear it again, that's why I know why I asked, but also to give Ricard. No, no, I, that, that clarification was very useful. Um, actually, let me, let me say first, um, the idea that uh, education, that human capital is central to the growth process and that human capital is schooling, and maybe schooling uh, qualified by PISA scores and 
some measure of quality. That uh, idea, I think, is fundamentally bullshit. Uh, that in some sense, that's an experiment the world has already done. Uh, the world has massively increased education, <coughs> massively increased schooling, let me correct myself, massively increased schooling, but uh, in proportions that are incredible, and that on average, countries that today have a level of schooling similar to that achieved by rich countries in 1970 have an income per capita which is less than a tenth of the income per capita of the countries that had that level of education in 1970. So, so in, in some sense, <coughs> if you, if you if, to say it in more technical terms, the cross section tells you nothing about the time series. That is, you look at a cross section, Rich countries have a lot of education. Poor countries have very little education. You assume if I were just had the education of rich countries, I would be able to replicate the income of rich countries. That experiment, I would say, has been done. I have some slides to show. Uh, that's not, that, that's not um, a, a would you say that's also true for PISA scores? Because you're absolutely yeah. right about school enrollment rates or. Uh, it, it's a little bit harder with PISA scores because we don't have as long a time series. But for the countries where we have um, domestic uh, like measures of quality that we've been able to do, there's nothing, there's nothing there. That is, the gaps that you want to explain are too large to be explained by the differences in quality and so on. So a second, institutions is, is a somewhat, in my mind, <coughs> uh, uh, a fairly uh, useless idea because part of the development <coughs> is the development of the institutions, right? And you have to ask yourself, how do institutions and the economy co-develop, right? That, uh, because, uh, you know, the easiest way to get good institutions is if you're rich, but how can you get rich if you don't have good institutions? But institutions are, are in my mind, the institutions are <coughs> solutions to social problems. That's what, in essence, they are. And they, they, they grow by solving problems that people face. They are, they are the consequence of people acting in order to address some issues, whether they were transaction costs or, or other kinds of, of, of problems. So uh, to say that institutions are, are a, separate variable that you could somehow <coughs> manipulate it without, a, 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 without understanding what's, what, what the economy are trying to address is, is I think, somewhat meaningless. I think a, my approach is to say, let's see what problems people have. Let's find solutions. And in the process of finding solutions and implementing them, the institutional tissue of the country grows. It's, uh, uh, um, but it's not like you say, before I can tackle growth, we have to improve the institutions. Let's look at the institutions. Uh, typically, institutions, you know, there is this tendency that people, for some reason, they prefer to fight evil more, more passionately than they're willing to fight for good. So, so you, if you frame the issue, issue as development, you don't get people as excited as fighting poverty. There are sort of like synonyms, uh, two ways of saying the same thing, but fighting poverty sounds much better. Fighting corruption sounds even better than creating institutions, right? So people, so there's this whole movement about, you know, corruption. But corruption in some sense is sort of like failed institutions or institutions that cannot even control their agents and so on. So it's the absence of a capable state more than the presence of, of something. It's, uh, and, and, and I find that just it, um, an agenda that just starts by saying we have to improve on the institutions uh, is so like, uh, what do they say? Uh, uh, Hamlet without uh, the prince or whatever. Um, so what I think is, is key to understand is why does technology not diffuse? You have to have a very good answer to why does technology not diffuse? How does technology diffuse when it does? 
and what are the things you can do to accelerate the diffusion of technology, and uh, especially new technology. And for example, in, uh, we've tried to establish, number one, that technology evolves parsimoniously. That is, you don't go from making coffee to making airplanes in one fell swoop. Uh, there's a, a set of capabilities that get accumulated through the process of development that allow you to do more things and more complicated things over time. In the metaphor of Scrabble, it means that development is about acquiring more letters and finding more valuable combinations of those letters that probably lead to longer words and longer words in Scrabble, at least, are more valuable. So, so you have to, the, the emphasis on, of development has to be on this expansion of the capability set. That's, that's what development is really about. It's the expansion of the capability set and the ability of these capabilities to connect themselves, to network, to, to cooperate, in, in the language of Professor Unger. Um, and uh, new letters have an odd way of getting into the system. You know, um, FDI might be a way of getting into the system, but migration, diasporas, return migration, are ways of infecting the system with new knowledge. And, and societies are radically different at tolerating these infections. One of the discoveries I've done over the last few years is that developing countries are amazingly closed to high-skill immigration. You, you know, anti-immigrant uh, politicians in the U.S. should emulate the, the developing countries. In, in Panama, in order to be a university professor, you have to be a citizen, which means that this course could not have happened. Uh, there isn't a single U.S.-born person sitting on this side of the room, right? So, so Harvard would not be possible, right? Uh, uh, you know, we're working on Jordan. You cannot be an engineer and be a foreigner. 54% of STEM workers in Silicon Valley are foreigners. And the other 46% are not Californians. Even though California has a population bigger than that of the average uh, developing country. So um, uh, the knowledge economy involves a big tolerance to diversity and so on that you know, might not buy, go well with you know, senses of identity, of, of ho social homogeneity, and so on. And societies that are more open in, that, in these dimensions have a, an easier chance. The ones that are not that open, for example, India, it has benefited enormously from the what they call the NRIs, the non-resident Indians, right? That a lot of the infection came to Bangalore and Hyderabad through the people they had in Silicon Valley and so on. So, so you know, the world exploits opportunities where it finds them, but I think that those are things that would prop up much higher in my agenda for development, which are things, you know, trying to understand the mechanisms of technology diffusion and, and putting them on steroids. So if, could I just, just follow up and press you on three sets of ideas in the hope of building a bridge between what you're saying and what we've been discussing here in the course. Mm -hmm. uh, and to that end, I want to begin less with your remarks here than with, with what you write in the, in the Atlas of Economic Complexity mm -hmm. that was distributed to the class. So in the Atlas, and as well in the reading from, from Danny, that was assigned. Uh, one idea is that this know-how is largely embodied in products, in the product space, and in the diversity of products. So Danny, for example, says that uh, contrary to what you might expect from the doctrine of comparative advantage, uh, an, an, an economy is benefited if it postpones uh, the moment of specialization, uh, you even say that specialization tends to become useful at more or less the level of Ireland, and focuses on a rich product space. 
in which there are many analogical connections that allow you to jump from one product and its embodied know-how to the other. Now, my impression is that there is in this formulation a danger of misplaced concreteness, that the crucial issue is being placed at the wrong level, at the level of the products rather than at the level of the underlying capabilities. Uh, and it would seem to me that this thesis of yours and of, and of Danny's would have to be qualified in at least two ways. So the first way is that uh, it must matter what the size of the economy and the country is. So that the task for Singapore is not the same as the task for China. And that for Singapore, at any stage of its evolution, it might make, not make sense to try and develop know-how in everything. The second qualification, um, uh, the second qualification has to do with the uh, uh, The, the, that the degree of, of, with what the benchmark is in the world economy at the time that this is happening. So it seems that some of these remarks, and especially Danny's remark in that paper, are against the background of the conception of specialization that we have in the era of industrial mass production, where there is a rigid division among sectors, and among professions and among specialties. But what happens in the age of the knowledge economy when the focus is on higher order capabilities, on multi-sectoral technologies, and on the ways of thinking and of acting that are suitable to them? Now, these two qualifications mm -hmm. would lead you to the thought that the crucial level is not the level of the product space, but the level of the capacities themselves that have a loose relation to the particular products and to their contingent diversification. And that these capabilities are in turn based on two main sets of factors. One set of factor is the nature of the education that is provided not just the quality of education in some generic sense, but what kind of education? And to what extent is, does this education develop what I'm calling these higher order <coughs> conceptual and practical capabilities? The second factor that is crucial is uh, the forms of collective action. And the extent to which these forms of collective action have certain characteristics. For example, that the way in which people work together in the division of labor not be prescribed by some entrenched scheme of social division and hierarchy. That it be possible to innovate in the forms of cooperation. Uh, that the distinction between jobs of supervision and jobs of execution be relativized. Uh, and that the stimulus to invention and entrepreneurship be combined with a draconian method of competitive selection after the stimulus is supplied. Uh, now, then comes my, uh, my second set of ideas. If you begin to follow this path in which the benchmark matters, that is, what is the standard of the most advanced practice of production in the historical epoch? Uh, then a, a, a crucial consideration becomes the extent to which this most advanced practice of production is either confined or disseminated. And when it is disseminated, it is deepened uh, as well as spreading. And there are two different mechanisms uh, by which that could happen. One mechanism which is more limited is more people get access 
to the most advanced part of the economy. They participate in it. The gateways are open, in this case, to the knowledge economy. The second mechanism is that the practices of the knowledge economy spread to other parts of the production system. Those are not the same thing, because when the practices of the knowledge economy spread, in the course of spreading, they have to be reinvented. They deepen by spreading, as opposed to just assimilating more people to the existing practice, which would be the model of transferring workers from agriculture to industry in an earlier stage of economic evolution. And that then leads to the third set of ideas in building this bridge between what you've written and said and what we're, and what we're discussing, uh, which is uh, it must matter to what extent the most advanced practice of production in particular and the production system in general uh, sustain a form of innovation that is largely external to the production system, that is imported into production from scientific and technological evolution, as opposed to being internal to the production system. That is, a production system which is constantly innovating and not just waiting for science to teach it something. And that's related to a second distinction, which is the extent to which innovation is episodic or punctuated it is episodic or punctuated if it's imported from the outside, as opposed to being perpetual. And the more it is endogenous to the production system, and the more it is perpetual, the more powerful the arrangement. Now, it, it seemed to me that we need all of these ideas, these three sets of ideas, to complete the bridge between your discourse and our discussion. And I'd just like you to comment on that. OK. Um, so I, uh, first of all, let me, let me tackle the issue of specialization versus diversification uh -huh. and size and so on. The first one is to say that specialization and diversification are two sides of the same coin. They are the same phenomenon described from two different vantage points. Uh, if you compare a rural medical facility with a major city hospital, in the rural medical facility, you have general practitioners that provide a re relatively narrow set of services. In a major city hospital, you have a bunch of doctors that have specialized in very different things that allow the hospital to provide a much broader set of services. Individual specialization leads to diversification at the higher level. If individuals specialize, the group diversifies. There are two sides of the same coin. The, the dimension at which this is relevant is not the country. It's the city. We have shown, I think to our satisfaction, which is, we, I don't know how easy it is to satisfy oneself, but anyway, uh, that um, in the compare, that is uh, the process of increased diversification, you can observe it at the level of cities. The city of Istanbul has 200 kinds of industries that are not present in, uh, in Izmir. And the city of Izmir has 100 kinds of industries that are not present in the city of Ankara. Uh, so, Istanbul is enormously more diversified than, than uh, the other areas. So, um, diversify, or if you compare uh, Austria, a country of 14 million people, or Switzerland, a country of something like 6 million people, with Nigeria, well, Austria is amazingly diversified, amazingly diversified, in, even though they are small. So, that's in my mind because it's really the diversification at the level of the city. Then a country is just sort of like a reflection of, of its most diverse cities. Um, so, so that's, that's there. So I would say, you know, diversification. I don't buy the story of uh, Ames and Batyar, this paper, 
that eventually you, I think that's a, it's a figment of, of classifications more than, than other things. Um, so, so diversification is, now, the product space is, if you want, like Mendelian genetics. It's, um, it's genetics before we had DNA. Uh, so in the sense that I can, I can find similarities between products, which I infer are similarities in the letters that they use. But I cannot see the letters directly, so I infer their relatedness through other means. But in a fully described process, you would have the letters of every product, and, and then it would be very clear what's the relationship between products. But essentially, it's how two products are near if the capabilities that you need for one are very useful in the production of the other. Which I think has an intuition of why manufacturing was such an avenue that Danny likes to emphasize. But then, just, just yeah. to press you on that yeah. one point here, yeah. God, then it seems that what's most important is not, especially as the economy evolves in the direction of the knowledge economy, what's most important is not the know-how to make a particular product, but it is the know-how to learn new forms of know-how and to switch. That is, it's this radical flexibility. Well, um, it's amazing to, to find out uh, how radical are the people's ability to change. We did this study, I mean, uh, Frank Nefke has this very nice paper showing what happens to workers that leave an industry in Germany. How can they reinvent themselves and go anywhere else in the economy and just become something else? Or are they very much limited by the kind of human capital, specific human capital that they bring in? And essentially, what he finds is that in the typical move of from when a worker leaves an industry in a certain occupation, he goes into other occupations that represent something like 2% of the German economy. So sort of like 98% of the German economy is irrelevant for their for their know-how. So, so there's a lot of specificity in what people know. Uh, they, a doctor doesn't become a dentist and, and vice versa. Uh, there's, there's much more <coughs> specificity in that, in, in, that, um, in that sense. So I think that's a little bit capturing the idea that we are different letters. We can participate in radically different words. We can participate in radically different words. And, and, and you will observe this phenotypical change in what gets produced but by people who are not changing themselves radically that much. They are just bringing their capabilities to a completely different set of issues and problems that they're working on. Um, on this issue of benchmarks of time, I think uh, there is, uh, you know, I, I, did you get to know Ray Vernon? Yeah, I, I, he had passed away when I joined the, the school. But uh, um, I, I was his undergraduate research assistant very long wow. time ago. So he had this idea that uh, there's a product, product cycles, cycle. no? The international product cycle. Yeah, so, so that things get invented in, in places uh, that require a lot of letters, places that have to be very diverse, very deep in, very deep bench of knowledge, if you want. Uh, but once they, they get sort of standardized, they can be produced elsewhere. Let me just give you an example. In order to be a successful car maker in the US, you have to be in Detroit. If you want to be a successful movie maker in the US, you have to move to Los Angeles. Why? Because you, know, you need a sound editing, video editing, special effects, background music, edit, you know, I don't, you know all the credits. Yesterday you saw the Oscars and it's amazing how many different things you can get awarded for. But uh, 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 that, that, is, that is the long word, that a movie requires all of these skills to be combined. Well, you could only combine those skills in Detroit. When the US import, imposed ex voluntary export restraints, quote unquote voluntary export restraints on Japan and Germany, that encouraged Japan and Germany to make cars in the US. But when they went to the US to make cars, they didn't go to Detroit. They went to South Carolina, they went to West Virginia, Mississippi, and so on. Why? Because 
in order to do whatever was needed to call a product made in the US, they didn't need to have in that location the diversity of skills that uh, you would have required otherwise. That means that suddenly these industries are much more footloose, that the communities that hosted them and so on can now be uh, um, uh, disrupted by places that are much simpler uh, with less diversity of capabilities and so on. So, so I would put it to you that uh, that's how I interpret these benchmarks of time that you were talking about. At the time of creation of the industry, there's a lot of tinkering and so on and so forth. Uh, and that tends to happen in one place. Once the industry becomes more standardized, it tends to diffuse more. From a development point of view, you want to be cognizant of where are those new opportunities of industries that are starting to diffuse? Because the typical problem in developing countries is not how you invent a new product, but why the hell do all these products that have already been invented, you seem to be unable to make them? Why, what, that's what I call, that's why I put so much emphasis on technology diffusion. Why, why, how can I get Sri Lanka, that's kind of trapped in garments and tea, uh, to start doing other things? Uh, and what, 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 what's impeding that from happening? But I don't, they don't need to be inventing cars. They just, they're not making any, right? Um, but, um, but potentially they could, and we need to figure out uh, why not. Um, uh, on the issue of how we get to having a more capable people operating at a higher level and so on, I would like to make a metaphor uh, to understand uh, two dimensions of human capital and education, if you want. And the metaphor is with light. You know, physicists think that light has two dimensions. One dimension you might call the intensity of light, and the other dimension is the spectrum of light, or the, you know, the frequency of light, and um, or the color of light, if you want. Um, I think that we've put a lot of emphasis on, on the intensity of light, high, low, high score, low score, but everybody's taking the same exam in PISA. You're testing for exactly the same, same questions, and everybody scores either high or low on that, on that vector. It's not a, do you know how to recognize an animal from its footprint in the snow, right? A, do you know how to extract uh, or how to know, fix a cavity, right? So, um, so I would put it to you that a lot of uh, the human capital people want uh, or that societies need to expand is on the spectrum dimension. Economists would call this on the extensive margin more than on the intensive margin. And we've been too much, the discussion has been too much on the intensive margin. And once you start looking at the extensive margin, what a society knows, it knows mainly in its firms, not in its schools. It would be impossible for teachers to teach what is known in the productive system. <coughs> because how would you ever get the teacher to know? How would you train somebody to? I mean, I think we guys must be in the upper echelons of people who've spent time in school. Right? But, so, that, but, but we that, don't know how to make shoes. But that's what the advanced technical schools do. Well, in the advanced technical work, I would say, marries production with accreditation yes. and training. So I think that, that the important dimension that I think to go to your knowledge economy is probably more of a German approach where um, you recognize that firms produce two things. They produce goods and services, and they produce skills in their labor force. That in the process of making things, you learn how to make them. So there's the acquisition of know-how through practice. And that's, that's a product that firms are making. That's a good that firms are making that they are not um, acknowledged for. Um, it generates in standard economics a very, a very um, very well-known market failures that justify you know, public intervention in training and so on. But I think, for example, Harvard would never do this because uh, we find that uh, 
um, there's an inherent value to tradition. Um, but in Northeastern, they require college students to take a year off to go and work in the middle of the process. And they think that that's a fundamental aspect of their education. Um, we don't do that uh, because we think that what the hell are they going to waste their time in the world? Uh, let's better stay here. Um, but <laughs> um, uh, we, you, you find that, um, by the way, for example, my daughter, if you don't know my daughter, it's a shame for you. Uh, um, my daughter is a YouTuber. She has more than 100 million views on YouTube. Uh, uh, Google her. It's, her name is Joanna Hausman, and she has a show called Joanna Rants, and she rants about the world. But um, how did she get there? Well, a college education prepared her for something like two years of unpaid internships. And it was those two years of unpaid internships that allowed her to accumulate a set of skills that she finally was able to put together in, in, in her shows, right? Now, I would put it to you that my daughter is extremely fortunate for having the ability to spend two years of unpaid internships, which I thought was cheaper than college because it didn't involve tuition. But, <laughs> but for most people, that would be unaffordable. So instead of doing what she did, which were interesting inter internships, uh, they have to you know, uh, be bartenders or whatever. So they cannot work on their skill set because, because they have, they're financially constrained. So I would put it to you that if you want to make the world fairer, you should make the world or more accessible. More people should have the opportunity that my daughter had of having two years of unpaid internship. Um, yeah, uh, unpaid RAs, that's, um, uh, but th th that's. Uh, uh, no, I mean, to make them affordable, you should, society should pay for that, right? And that, all, that all, will make me better off also. All, all the, <laughs> <laughs> all so so let, let, me, let, me, let me return to some of these issues from a, from a somewhat, uh, you know, different angle. You said, Ricardo, I mean, the central question is, is why does technology not diffuse? Mm -hmm. And this is very much our core problem here, too. But that has right two 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 sides to it, or two versions of that question. And uh, so, one broad issue is the relationship between those two sides of the question. One is um, uh, why does technology not diffuse from the rich to the poor countries? But a second side, and that's the, the traditional way traditional way in which we think about development. But it was also implicit in a lot of what you said that a central problem today is why does technology not diffuse within a country? Uh, for example, you mentioned in, you know, in the United States that you have these islands, you call them <coughs> national parks, only if the people living them were as happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have these sort of big you know, uh, islands in between metropolitan areas that are diversified, high productivity, provide the better jobs and so forth. But there's a big gap between productivity uh, in those metropolitan centers and the big uh, gaps in between. And as you said, that's part of the big po political problem. Uh, a lot of our uh, focus here is, is, is how to close, close that gap. Uh, in the developing world, you have um, the same versions of those same things, that you have many highly productive cities. You gave the example of Istanbul, uh, but a very large hinterland in, in some ways you know, the, the main difference between the United States or a middle-income country might be that, you know, that, that there is a tinier sliver of advanced production uh, in, uh, in the metropolitan areas in the developing world, but otherwise that domestic segmentation, that domestic disintegration uh, or lack of dissemination is, is also uh, a, a, a common problem in the rich and the poor countries. Um, so, so the, the issue is, so, so we, we have to deal with both of those, um, that both kinds of dissemination uh, or, or lack of dim dissemination. And the question is, is, is how, do we, um, uh, how do we overcome that problem? How do we make technology uh, disseminate? Um, so many of the things that um, you suggested, um, uh, so I'm trying to think about sort of what are some of the, 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 the concrete operational implications of this perspective. One is you say, well, you know, if, if you know, the, you, you, some, at, at, at one point you, you presented this as a kind of a, 
large-scale coordination failure, that developing countries are, are stuck, that they don't have uh, enough letters and uh, no individual uh, has any incentive to acquire any of the letter if others aren't doing so at the same time, so you can get stuck. And, and so part of this you know, is, is a problem, is a kind of a coordination failure that might suggest the government doing something. You gave the example of um, uh, skilled uh, immigration, that one way to, sh to you know, <coughs> sort of short shortcut this problem might be just to bring some of the letters from, from abroad. Um, the, the, the question that, that, that Roberto raised was, um, what can we do? And he suggested that this was something that was new and qualitatively different for the future, if I understood you correctly. What can we actually make the cities or the advanced productive sectors of the economy reach out to the back, that is, expand uh, towards the areas that are currently not integrated with those advanced sectors, uh, and in the process reinvent themselves and deepen uh, the kind of, of technologies and, 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 and uh, uh, mechanisms of production that they are involved in. So I don't. So uh, so for, I guess you know two one two questions. One is, are these two dimensions of the problem similar or dissimilar? That is across countries and within countries. Um, and, and and secondly, you know, focusing on the second of those, because I think the second of those questions is common to both the advanced and the, and the developing countries. What is it that can be done to sort of, in some sense, backward integrate um, the more productive farms of these economies, whether it's in Brazil or Turkey or in the United States, to encompass more of the hinterland? So, so Danny, just on that second question, uh, a useful distinction is the distinction between two ways to solve that problem. So in the business schools, what seems to prevail is the idea that that problem can be solved at the micro level to the extent that it can be solved by multiplying the number of good firms, which they may call disruptive firms. So it's a kind of horizontal expansion. And some of us think that that doesn't face the problems and that the problem has to be dealt with at a vertical axis in that there's something about the framework of the arrangements and assumptions that has to be modified, even though modified piecemeal, which is a different approach. And it seemed to me that implicit in Ricardo's writing and oral remarks here is the necessity of that vertical axis, that the mere horizontal multiplication of the so-called good firms uh, is not an effective solution to this problem. So then the, your question narrows down to the issue of what is the programmatic content of this vertical axis? So um, the, the way um, uh, Marx had this uh, concept of reproduction. Um, uh, that is, what does a system need to have to sort of like to replicate itself? In science, they call these autocatalytic cells. That is, you know, a, a molecule cannot create itself, but a set of molecules can have a set of reactions that recreates the set of molecules. And we as human beings have a little bit that capacity. We are a set of processes that recreate ourselves, uh, right? And and. And an economy is, in some sense, a set of processes that recreates the whole economy over time. So, and the question is, what, what, what does something need to have in order to be part of that autocatalytic set? Um, if I send a um, nuclear engineer to Accra in Ghana, the question is, uh, how is that going to change Ghana, right? Uh, and the answer is probably it's going to add one more taxi driver. Right? Because there are no um, useful connections between that bit, that letter, if you want, and, and the rest of the letters in the system that can, in some sense, integrate that. And as a consequence, the question is, uh, what happens when that uh, nuclear engineer dies? 
has the knowledge gone or has it been transmitted and re replicated and left in the society living somewhere? I find that one of the most understudied areas uh, uh, of, of knowledge, management, and know-how is this relationship uh, between uh, the places of instruction and say like Harvard and, and the economy. The way we model them is, uh, is that you know, people take some time out of working to accumulate something and then they go back to work. <coughs> what is the process whereby these entities sort of like hold knowledge and so on? Why are there so many professional associations? Why is it that the accountant belongs to the accounting association and the lawyers become to the lawyers association? And so, what, what is it in these other typically non-market organizations that seem to be playing a function in the sort of like the preservation and transmission of this social knowledge? So I think that we don't fully understand that dimension. Uh, and I think you want to make a contribution that talks about that. When you talked about the scientific and technological structures sort of like being sort of like outside the productive system, and you, you would never describe MIT that way. <coughs> MIT is deeply embedded. I mean, the number of MIT professors that have startups and the number of high-tech companies that want to locate next to MIT and so on, they seem to be there seems to be a lot of interaction uh, there. And, and what I would like to better understand is how does it, what does it take, not for an individual to go to a place um, with a bit of missing know-how, but what would it take for that know-how to be able to be reproduced in that space? So that becomes a, a part of the new equilibrium. And, and that, I think, is, is something that we need to spend more time thinking about um, what, what are the institutional forms in which societies save this this knowledge maybe I mean can you give a couple of you know from your experience around the world maybe just give us a couple of examples of where sort of it, you know some of these mini ecosystems have 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 developed um, and and what was and, and and how how that came about and what was the role of private actors and the public actors? Well, I mean, you would ask yourself. Talk about Panama, for example. Well, pa Panama is, um, is a great example because you know everybody wants to be like Switzerland, but uh, nobody wants to be like Panama. And, and Panama is sort of like, if Panama had failed, we would have said, oh, it's obvious. But Panama has been the fastest growing country in Latin America for the last 25 years. and. <laughs> Um, uh, what ended up happening, I mean, let, let me describe you what ended up happening, and then you can ask yourself, why did it happen, and what was there a role for government? But what ended up happening is that they had a canal. The US was managing the canal. The US wanted ships to go as quickly as possible through the canal, and, and, and when the canal reverted to, to um, Panamanian uh, control, the first thing they realized is that there were no ports around the canal because the U.S. was not thinking of port. It was just the way. You... So they built some ports, and that allowed for more logistic kinds of operations to happen, and then consequently, you know, in, in free ports that could, you know, bring things from China and supply Latin America and so on, which needed banking international banking operations, so they created an offshore banking system. They were left with two huge military bases. They didn't know what to do with those military bases. So on one side, they created a knowledge city a, 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 where they wanted to attract the R&D kinds of activities. And in the other one, they created a, like an industrial zone. Um, it, in the process of trying to make them a success, they discovered that they had a law that prohibits to have more than 10% foreigners in a firm. And that constraint was binding in the new kinds of things that they were trying to build. So they exempted these zones from that law. In, they brought in, they approved the law for regional headquarters of multinational corporations. So 
170 multinational corporations kind of moved in, their regional headquarters there. They were successful for maybe other reasons to have a very successful regional aircraft, uh, regional uh, airline company, Copa, which connected all the connected Panama to all the major cities in Latin America. So the regional headquarters loved that because now they had direct flights everywhere. These, these people brought in some 30,000 high-income expats, which wanted good education, good health care, good entertainment, good restaurants, and so on. So quality of life improved enormously. As a consequence, tourism developed. So you have this ecosystem of a set of activities that become more valuable because the other one is there. The, the canal became more valuable because the ports were there. The zones became more valuable because the canal and the ports were there. The financial system became more valuable because these highly trading companies were all there. The, uh, the, um, because of that, you could get the regional headquarters. The regional headquarters co-evolved with the successful airline company. And, and so, so the ecosystem was formed uh, uh, gradually so that the activities that now Panama is able to host were unthinkable before, but uh, so like evolved uh, uh, somewhat organically with some kind of government push. Obviously, the government was involved in, in authorizing the ports, in creating the zones, in creating the exemptions to the law, in passing a, um, a regional headquarters law, in this coevolution between the airport and the airline. Uh, so so uh, uh, that, that would be an example of, of the, the things I have in mind. Yeah, I think that, that helped, I think, make a, make a lot of these things a little bit more concrete. Maybe we should just, uh, you know, get some, some discussion from, from the class uh, questions. But by the way, the, 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 they're very good in trade and so on, and the trade happens to be done by Lebanese and Jews. So the know-how for trade came from outside. It's a great question. Um, um, people have been talking about the death of distance. At the same time, uh, real estate prices in city centers have been skyrocketing. So people's willingness to pay to be in the center of things has been going up. Um, we did this paper on business travel. We'd say, why the hell would you pay airline tickets, hotels, and so on? if you can pick up the phone or do FaceTime or Skype or whatever, right? Why, why would a company spend money in business travel? And we find that business travel is growing at multiples of the rate of growth of GDP. So it's not that, well, we still have to do some, but we'll do more through Skype. Uh, so it seems to me that that is informative of the nature of the difference between knowledge and information. It, it, there's been a reduction in the cost of transmitting information, but in some sense, the CPU is the brain. And there is some difference between moving information to the brain or, and moving the brain to the place. So you, you need to move the solving, the problem solving capacity of the brain, and, and in problem solving is no longer an individual issue because we don't have enough individual knowledge to solve most problems. We have to network with people. And that's why, you know, I don't know how many co-authors Danny uh, has, but my experience is that a paper that is done with a co-author who's in a remote location advances <coughs> 10 times faster when you meet than when you operate remotely, right? for some reason that we don't yet understand. <laughs> uh, maybe technology will improve over time. But what I can tell you is that a, a, a lot of the, we have a paper that shows that it, 
several things. One is that business travel um, seems to be more related to owning companies in other places that you have to sort of like help manage and so on so that that uh, foreign companies need to move people around to, to make the technology live through. That they, there's, there's a sharing of, of capabilities within the firm across countries that is happening. That's one, one dimension. Uh, uh, the other one is that we find that where this is not causal, just predictive, um, uh, you become good in the future, in the things that the countries of your business visitors are good at. That is, if you get a lot of Germans, you'll be good at cars or kind of chemicals or whatever, right? And so, so there is a, a, a business travel predates changes in comparative advantage. So, so for some reason, I, I, I mean, human mobility seems to be central to technological mobility to technological diffusion. And it's not just moving people, it's people being able to network and interact with other people. So I'm very interested in these ideas uh, of forms of cooperation that, that uh, Professor Angor was mentioning because, you know, people talk about this thing they call KIBS, Knowledge Intensive Business Services. Uh, uh, firms don't, often don't have the capacity to improve on their systems, they call McKinsey. And they tell McKinsey, tell me, tell me, how am I doing things differently? How could I do things differently? And then McKinsey comes with a PowerPoint presentation. They are allergic to documents. Um, um, but um, that means that uh, these people you want to be the creative ones and so on, they may actually agglomerate in firms and, and sell these services to to firms, so it may, it, it may organize itself in ways different from the ones uh, that we would have expected. So this is a theme actually that we'll, we'll come back to, I think probably prominently next week when Chuck Sable is here, that these relational aspects of these new forms of production, which you know, militate in the other direction of the decline in the cost of transport and communication, which actually keeps activities together and creates agglomeration, is another strong feature, which is sort of going in the opposite direction. So we will talk more about that. Uh, why don't you take your questions, Ricardo? Okay. Let me take three in, that way. Pretty. I have a question. Can you speak up so people in the back can hear? Okay, second question, Flick? Yeah, for someone who understands yeah. complexity theory very well, what do you think is the main critique of the theory? Mm -hmm. like shortcoming or weakness? Okay. Y uh, yes, oh, sorry. Okay, there. Uh, my question has to do with uh, migration and how do you see the model of, of some uh, involved countries, uh, for instance, uh, the Emirates, where they have like a lot, a lot of, uh, like a lot, a chunk, a lot, uh, a, like a large chunk of the population is, is an expats, but they don't actually mix with the locals and they don't have the, uh, enough incentive. 
pay longer. So you you see do you think that that's sustainable or so I mean what what do you think that the model uh, should be that should be? Perfect. Okay, let me stop there and I'll I'll, I'll revert back. So number one. How do I think of informality? I think of informality as essentially one-letter words. It's, uh, it's not really about, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff about the cost of formalization and, uh, and um, uh, you know, differential taxes and, and uh, Santiago Levy has a book on, on it and, and so on. It's all about these di uh, distortions and differential legal treatments that are causing this phenomenon. To me, it's, it, that's not the core of the story. The core of the story is how many different brains with, di with differential skill are you bringing together in production. <clears throat> uh, the informal sector is these very, very minuscule firms. They're bringing in people who are not very diverse, so they essentially are bringing the same letter. They are making one-letter words. And one-letter words are typically very low productivity, very low efficiency, very low value. They compete enormously among themselves. So uh, there, there's no specificity to, uh, to differentiation of what they do and, 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 and so on. So that to me is, is the problem. The question is why can't people connect to bigger things, right? In that sense, uh, Marx's idea of becoming a laborer and and, and just selling your labor to people who have a better means of, you know, of production uh, would be an improvement in, in productivity. And, and the question is, why did that not happen? And I think it has to do with these fixed costs of creating these spaces. Uh, I visited the industrial zones in India. Uh, they're amazingly crowded. Uh, they're full. Uh, they're amazingly poorly connected. The trucks cannot get on the highway between, between Delhi and, and, and Mumbai during the daytime. <coughs> they have to stop because they're so crowded. They, they have to stop and wait for the nighttime to, to travel. It, it, it tells you that um, there was never enough attention or capacity to invest in the creation of the infrastructure, if you want, that a modern society would have required for, for, for this to have evolved. Uh, so, so that's why it, it's an equilibrium in which capitalism did not succeed in organizing production. Uh, let me go next to this uh, migration issue. Uh, uh, what we know, I mean, there are plenty of studies that have documented that involuntary migra long term migrations have had enormous technological consequence for the receiving country. For example, people have studied uh, the impact of the 1685 uh, revocation of the Edict of Nantes that forced all, that kicked out all these um, Huguenots from France. And, um, and uh, in 1685, there was the Elector of Brandenburg at an edict saying that they tolerate Huguenots. So many Huguenots went to, to Prussia. And we know where they went, and we know what happened immediately and what happened afterwards. And it's amazing how when you move the people with the know-how and so on, they replicate these skill sets and these industries. Um, there is the story of Spital Fields in, I don't know how they pronounce it, in London. It's, now it's a neighborhood of London. In those days, it was a village uh, that they, they got some some Huguenots who were very good at uh, having sort of like silk processed in a particular way. And uh, that caused a collapse in the imports of silk from, from France. And it made uh, Britain a major exporter of silk textiles and so on. And the French, when they realized, tried to get these families back. Uh, <coughs> anyway, so, so in, the, in US history, there was a fight over uh, people uh, that were working in industries and in manufacturers in, in Britain coming to the US with the know-how and applying it here. And the Brits were very pissed off in the 19th century at this uh, idea. It's like the Americans with the Chinese now. So, that, uh, so 
so that we know. I do a lot of work on, on in, in Gulf countries, and in Gulf countries, they have typically 85% of private employment is foreigners. But the foreigners stay on average less than three years. So there is no time for them either to accumulate more, much know-how there or for them uh, to, uh, um, so they, 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 they accumulate two years of experience, but the country is left with nobody with 10 years of experience. So there's no, uh, so, uh, there is no process whereby uh, this migration gets any cumulative effect. You're constantly losing it. So in, in Singapore, uh, they tried to get um, R&D started. They created two huge parts of the city. One is called the Biopolis, and the other one is called the Fusionopolis. And the Biopolis was supposed to be about biotech, and the Fusionopolis was supposed to be about fusion, or media, IT, whatever, right? And what they would do is they would pay through the nose to get some famous American professor to move his lab to the country. And what they realized is that, okay, so now they got the American professor and his lab in the country. Uh, you know, the American professor had college-age children. Eventually, the children wanted to go to study. Uh, There's no path to citizenship. Uh, so in the end, they realized it was not permeating into the country as much. You can document that the people had come and they had produced things while they were in <coughs> Singapore, but the impact on the whole social fabric was not there. In Kendall Square, you don't see as fancy buildings as you will see in Singapore to host R&D, but it's happening kind of like more organically because there's a reason to be here. And it has something to do with the fact that the people who come think that their, their children might want to stay, so it creates a very different relationship to the place that allows for, for longer term investment in, in the area. Um, I think that on the question of the weakness of complexity, I think that um, a complexity analysis is useful in order to study the spectrum of light. That is to, what we've tended to do when you think of GDP is that we have all of these different forms of production and you add them all up, and they become just a number. And the question is, how much information did you lose when you just aggregated and things became a scalar? What Matthew would call a scalar, just a number. Um, what, what was the valuable information in the structure that you destroyed? And does that structure matter <laughs> for things? So I think uh, the most useful aspects of complexity tools is in letting the structure speak to you. Exploring the consequence of structure. Um, and, yeah. So, this is really speaking to the question on your stuff about the knowledge economy. What do you see an example uh, of how we can bring that about? So, one place I don't think we look enough is to the knowledge economy. If you look at what, ha what happened in the United States or in the Silicon Valley, where you have a lot of technologies coming from afar. You have connections. That is, the whole game is based on network effects. You have increasing returns for scale. First copy costs a billion dollars. Second copy costs nothing. You've got an ecosystem where complementary products were able to take off. It seems to me that's precisely the model that you're groping for in your analysis. And the question for me is, why aren't we trying to generalize from what happened? in the high-tech industry, to the knowledge economy in the United States. And let, let me, I have a, a view on this. Uh, let me recommend the book, uh, which is the history of the Bell Lab. It's called The, Ide the Ideas Factory or something. Huh? Yeah. OK. I think that uh, they say that Silicon Valley is the only place in the world that doesn't want to become a new Silicon Valley. Like everybody is emulating Silicon Valley and, and, and very few people are succeeding at it. And I think that um, Silicon Valley is uh, not the first act of a play. It's like the third act of a play. 
And the third act of a play doesn't work without act one and act two, kind of. In, in one, one history of Silicon Valley is that nine people moved from Bell Labs to Silicon Valley in 1958 or so. These nine people were led by this guy, William Shockley. Um, and William Shockley apparently was a bastard and he treated them poorly and thought they were all stealing from him and so on. So they all left the group and created something called Fairchild Semiconductor. And Fairchild Semiconductors made the first integrated circuits it, with a contract with the Defense Department and so on. And then these people who created Fairchild Semiconductors all went on to create a bunch of other companies and so on. So, so the stuff was infected into Silicon Valley by something that came from outside. Now, what was that thing that came from outside? It was the opposite of Silicon Valley. It was a um, government-regulated private monopoly that had such secure and guaranteed high profits that they could dedicate massive amounts of money inside the company to Bell Labs. It was, it, it was centralized, hierarchical if you want, but it allowed enormous freedom internally. And these guys invented an inordinate amount of things. They invented radar, they invented the transistor, they invented all the little technologies around landline telephony, uh, transmission lines, uh, replication, amplification, uh, whatever, switches. Um, they discovered the you know, background radiation and the Big Bang and so on. They, so radar, I mean, you name it, they invented an, lasers. That all came from something that is the, like the organizational opposite of Silicon Valley. If you look at today, R&D spending today, you would be surprised at how much of R&D spending today is done by Apple, Google, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals and so on. So we have this illusion of creating this very diverse, like open, nice, cool, you know, angel capital, venture capital, incubators, accelerators, and so on. That is a super fragile ecosystem that can only survive in very particular instances. And the US didn't start that way. It ended that way, but it didn't start that way. So, so, what, so what's the lesson? The lesson is that I don't think that, that it's a very successful strategy to try to create an ecosystem of interconnected small firms that are trying to do things. There might be a bigger role for big firms. I wrote an op-ed once called the conglomerate way the conglomerate way to growth or something, by making the following point. Japan and Korea did not diversify because they got more diverse firms. They diversified because their conglomerates internally diversified. And there's a logic why conglomerates would diversify internally. Because if a startup has a uh, no, fantastic death rate. Because of that, it is a very risky proposition. Because of that, you know, there's very little capital that gets allocated there and, and very big problems. If you do it within an organization like Bell Labs or like Samsung or like uh, Toyota or like Sony, you are operating inside an internal capital market. A company with managerial capital that can deploy it in, 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 in different directions with reputational capital that if there is a missing bit of know-how, they can acquire a company and so on. So it, it is, I mean, there's a reason why we are multicellular bodies. So for starters, that answer yeah. brings us back to the central theme we've been discussing mm -hmm. at the start. So the marriage of the state with the oligopoly mm -hmm. Well, it, it depends on, 
uh, I mean, that might be a question. Another question might be, if you're a developing country, uh, is Silicon Valley, I mean, can you do a Silicon Valley? Because obviously, a Silicon Valley has, has more, is more cool. It's, it's more California-like. It's more kind of like, has more of our values. Small is beautiful, more flexibility, more entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. Many of these large companies like Google and so on try to recreate that environment internally by giving their, their employees a lot of freedom uh, to invent and so on, but protecting them in something which allows them to make these longer term bets of not being you know, scared that you know, their burn rate of their capital is, is can and maybe the next, the next um, uh, but capital the replenishment won't be there and so on. Yeah. But so, I mean, everything you say makes a lot of sense for the developing countries where in terms of these missing pieces and, and the challenge of putting, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, mm -hmm. and, and the, the difficulty of, of solving that coordination challenge of getting all these pieces. And sometimes, you know, you're lucky and you take the right decisions and you have the right people and a Panama happens. But most of the time, you, you know, you're, you're stuck. But here you are in the United States or in Western Europe where you, know, you have done this. You're at the frontier. You have all these successful models. You have the Silicon Valleys. And, and, and yet you have large parts of the country just um, essentially cut off from that. So what's, what, what is it going to, sort of what, does, what do your theories say about <coughs> why that, that internal convergence is not taking place uh, in, in, the, in the United States? Okay, well, le let me preface by saying that the difference in income per capita between Mississippi and Connecticut is something like a factor of two. Uh, the difference in income per capita between Chiapas and Nuevo León is something like a factor of seven. So there is much more convergence uh, in the developing world, in the developed world to begin with. So, so the gaps are smaller. Um, uh, number two, I would say, um, the future will depend on the diffusibility of future technology. Um, now, I would say that, let me make the following statement. The complexity of a technology makes diffusion more difficult. The more complex a technology, the less likely it is that it will diffuse and the more <coughs> it will concentrate in complex places. Now, some of the new technologies are not complex, are simpler. In the sense, for example, take artificial intelligence. What does artificial intelligence do? It essentially transforms know-how into machines, right? So it, <coughs> it reduces the need for know-how by embedding it in tools. And by, through that mechanism, it makes the technology less complex. For example, it used to be, or it is the case, that to get a taxi driver's license in London, you need to study for three years. The alternative is that you use Waze. And so suddenly, uh, that technology is much less know-how intensive. You know that? So, uh, that will mean that simpler places will be able to participate in production that they're currently excluded from. That might be a threat to all the places where you know, some industries have agglomerated, they might disperse. But that, but that answer presupposes that these advanced places like Silicon Valley present a model that we want the other places to converge to. But there's a limitation. So just, just take your question, what does the technology do or what it should do? What it should do, like artificial intelligence, is perform for us everything that we have learned how to repeat so that we can perform with the technology what we do not yet know how to repeat. Now, if that's the criterion, it's massively undeveloped even in the most advanced areas. So presumably, it's not just a problem of making the backward converge to the advanced. It's a problem of, through the process of diffusion, deepening the untapped potential 
of this knowledge economy, which is, which is truncated by virtue of being confined. And that leads you back to this issue of the framework. Yeah, I mean, I mean um, we've gone from having three broadcast TV stations to having hundreds. Hundreds and so on, and now you know anybody can upload stuff on the web, right? So, so in some sense, the world is moving in the direction that you mentioned. The number of people producing content is probably skyrocketing, and the barriers to entry are declining, and uh, and likes are are your evolutionary mechanism of selection, no? Um, so a little bit of that is is happening in some parts of the economy. I would ask you. What are the positive deviances in the world today that signal the things you want to create in the world tomorrow? That, uh, so, I mean, so the qu qu a question, and one of our key questions here, whether there's a tension between this process of innovation and uh, inclusion. That uh, one of the points that Daron made uh, last week was that, look, you know, during history, uh, we didn't you know, sort of, uh, you know, we had reason, at least exposed, not to worry about the effect of technological change on employment and inequality because it turned out that even though innovation may have been labor displacing, um, there, were, there was always sufficient productivity growth in the rest of the economy to absorb uh, people who were uh, displaced from the uh, jobs that were being quickly automated or replaced by machinery. So, you know, the you know when people moved out of agriculture into the cities because of very rapid technological change and mechaniz mechanization in agriculture, you know, cities were developing and manufacturing. You know, was rising. So these people could, in fact, be employed in the cities at much higher levels of productivity. Um, in in you know many developed countries when they began to deindustrialize. Uh, you know, there were a lot of services of very high productivity, and therefore people could move to jobs uh, that were, in fact, much better than being just a production worker in manufacturing. The question is whether we are at a juncture where leaving you know, the process on its own, um, that uh, these innovations are so labor-replacing without sort of some action, uh, uh, collective action that, that reorients this process of technological innovation, uh, that the rest of the economy isn't developing sufficient number of productive jobs, that we will have this tension between the development of sort of these islands of high productivity and high innovation, uh, but a lot of people being actually sh shifted to, to jobs that uh, Aren't necessarily good jobs. <coughs> um, I, 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 you know, sort of. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and 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 the reason to be concerned with that is we're talking about all this innovation on the one hand. <coughs> it's easy; you can see it with your own eyes. But that yet, you know, the economy-wide, uh, you know, productivity figures are really very dismal, um, and that's really the you know that's where the disconnect and the tension potentially <coughs> between innovation and inclusion arises. Uh, let, let me, number one, share the concern that um, I think Latin America, your own work uh, shows that, uh, that you know, productivity at the firm level has been growing, but uh, the high productivity sector has been shrinking in terms of total employment, and consequently people end up in low productivity activities. Why, why hasn't that uh, succeeded more? I tend to think that it's because... Um, in Latin America doesn't, uh, hasn't find, found a way to export from its cities. That there are people concentrating in cities, but there are very few ways of using a urbanite effort to create value abroad. As a consequence, as the city grows, it, you know, it, 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 uh, the process is not sustainable. And we're in the process of comparing uh, Latin American cities to Asian cities in terms of their structure of production and so on. We think that there might be something there. That, uh, that, and that, to me, is a concern. I know that you have been a pessimist on export-led growth, and we've had the opportunity 
to discuss these things before. But my concern is um, if, you, if you don't connect uh, your people's willingness to work with opportunities out there, <coughs> you don't get the possibility of scaling industries because you'll be restricted by the domestic market. And, and that's going to you know, cause lower prices, uh, shrinking markets, et cetera. It won't, it won't scale. Uh, that's why I think that uh, global markets are, are very important. Number two, uh, those global markets may be moving into other things. Um, uh, you know, uh, economists have this thing that they call the theory of the firm. What things get done inside the organization, what things you can buy outside the organization. And uh, there's been this process of, uh, of uh, um, having more and more activities being uh, um, produced outside the organization, you know, back offices, now they call it business process outsourcing, now they call it uh, knowledge intensive business process outsourcing and so on and so forth, that may allow people to participate in, 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 in production uh, on, on a broader scale. I would say in- But in, in what kind of production, in the routinized Part of production, right? Well, uh, uh, that is routine. There is a there is an optimal balance between routine and innovation. That is, <coughs> the, uh, let, let me put it to you this way: if we make things that we know how to make. So we have to allocate some time to making things, and sometimes to thinking about what are the things that we want to make, right? Because we are shrinking in the amount of time necessary to make things, we are spending more and more time in thinking about the things we should be making. So in, in total employment, you have more people dedicated to R&D and, and fewer people making things, right? If you take a typical airline aircraft company, they spend 10 years thinking about the, the airplane they're going to build, and then they spend you know, the years building the airplane. But the amount of time you spend just thinking of what it is that you're going to do is going up. So you're saying it, the ideal would be everybody's thinking about the things we should be doing. I say no. There, no, 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 I wasn't intending that. No? <clears throat> I, was, I was referring to what seems to be a momentous bifurcation that is happening, that the people that control the inner sanctum of this advanced part of the production system discover a way to transform a larger and larger part of the production process into commodities, into routines. And then they subcontract them to other parts of the world where there are low wages and low taxes, and they retreat into their, into their little island. Uh, and it's in their interest to do that. And so there is no spontaneous process that would turn this in another direction unless there's some collective project that moves it in another direction. Maybe, I, I want to emphasize also the following things. Um, Amazon is a way for anybody to reach a global market, right? You become an Amazon supplier, you list there. So, so some of these, let, let me finish with the following uh, idea. Unless you're really successful that Amazon steals your product. <laughs> Let me, let me finish, if you want, with, with this thought. Um, this aggregation of knowledge is so important that value is now being concentrated in the aggregators. That is, you know, Airbnb is worth more than Hilton, right? Uh, Google is worth more than any of the websites that Google uh, uh, connects, right? So it used to be that it was, you know, the power is with the people who own the means of production. And power is now sort of like with the people who own the means of networking. And, and um, um, uh, the network is where the value is being created. And part of the inequalities of the world has to do with the fact that um, the network generates some rents uh, that are, are being very you know, captured in a very concentrated way. But that in some sense, if you could redirect those rents to expand the network, you may be moving in the direction you want. This is the perfect transition to our discussion next week. So these yeah. networks and new forms of production and organization is the...
is the topic of the discussion uh, next week. So um, let's uh, thanks, thank very much um, Ricardo for, for really his... <laughs>